find that balance. And I'll do that with everybody to make you feel like, oh, I got you. Because I'm actually, boom, 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 boom. This position, my line, this is where it's at, this is where it needs to be. <laughs> Not that long, honestly. I think maybe six years. Yeah. Felix started before me, actually. He started at three years old. And I was just a parent sitting on these benches. Three and a half weeks, but um, I feel I already feel like it's the best place ever. Like, everyone here is like, super welcoming. Everyone here is super like, helpful with me being the newest one. I just turned 25. Josh Toledo. Great. It looks, it, it looks great that uh, yeah. even though you're not in the Philippines, Filipinos here, even though the races are practicing. I wanted um, kind of a means to help teach them about our culture. Um, because honestly, growing up here from the age of four, I didn't know a lot. You know, I, I did what I could to learn and study, but um, having this group here, you know, helps a lot. Uh, knowing that the art comes from the Philippines, um, that's just the opens of floodgates, you know. So when we've gone to visit the Philippines, like, oh, okay, this is where Grand great grandmaster was. So I'm always, I rely on structure a lot, and for, and not to say that he doesn't have structure, but he's very good at flow. And whenever he sees someone doing like something that he can do better at, he applies it to everyone. So it's something that I can't understand yet, but if he applies it to everyone, then everyone understands. So we're all on the same level. Uh, so our lineage is the Robio Escrima, or the method of the Robio Escrima. Uh, founded officially, you know, we started our first school in 1961, and that's through uh, Great Grandmaster Braulio Montevideo, which is my great grandfather on my mother's side, so maternally. Um, pretty much, he came in from the Philippines. He's um, sort of situated, born in Ormoc City, in Leyte, in the southern Visayas. Uh, his time training with who was known as Faustino Ablin. So Faustino Ablin was, was known as a, depending on what side of history, right? So what side of history, in, in regards to the Americans and the Spanish, he was a, a rebel, right, rebel leader that led these sort of um, um, zealots that followed these, this man because of his religious prowess or, you know, and you know, they were killing Americans, killing Spanish. Um, to the Filipinos, to the, the people that followed him, he was known as the father or our papa. So in the, um, and I was actually able to kind of do some history um, when I first took over the school. I was like, no, how deep does our oral history actually go in actual history, right? So a lot of times, you know, you hear about oral history and you hear about these systems where, you know, they talk about the blind princess or they talk about these mysterious things and how much of that is actually true. Um, I honor all those lineages, right? Um, that's, that's, their, that's their truth, right? Uh, but I was actually able to kind of actually find some facts and in the early 18, or actually late 1800s, um, early 1900s, there was this, what they call the Dios Dios movement. And um, General Faustino Bland, he was known as a general in regards to the Pulahan army. Um, and he was those, the people that he led, the villages that he, in regards to, that he sort of led and, and father in regards to religion, because they saw him as a religious leader. A lot of these guys were called father or papa. So you can actually put in Papa Faustino Blin on some, some history which will come up. Uh, so in the early 1900s, he led this movement and the Americans actually had a bounty on his head. Um, so it, it kind of ties into a lot of names in regards to the revolution and stuff like that. But Faustino um, kind of led this group called the Polohanes to who fought against the, the Americans at this time. Um, so that's where our lineage kind of starts. My grandfather, 
um, the, as the story goes, he, he left home. He had an abusive home. And at the age of six, you know, who, who at six years old is like, this, this is not for me. I'm gonna leave home. So he talks about, you know, having the fortitude or the knowledge to be like, at that age, be like, if I go to the city, I'm probably gonna get into trouble. I'm probably gonna die young. But let me go out into the country. Let me go out into the mountains and see where God takes me. So that's the story. He leaves his home. He travels for a few days. At night, he would sleep in the trees because they got these big snakes that eat kids and little goats and stuff like that, as, as they tell us. So he traveled and he came upon a little fire, a little garden, a little hut. Um, he fell asleep and when he woke up, there was a man, an old, old man. Um, they say he was probably in his late, his, his early hundreds uh, about that time. That's how old he probably was. Um, and this was after he actually, um, Faustino escaped imprisonment. Um, so they found each other and actually the date that he was imprisoned, um, my grandfather was born in 1900. He ran, um, General Faustino was arrested around 1902, 1903. Um, as my father left home, their paths crossed. So where he disappeared out of jail, he found himself connected to my grandfather at a young age. So history actually sort of ties that in together. It was pretty interesting. So in a book, uh, I keep forgetting to find this book. So I found a book written by a captain um, who was um, actually given the orders to track down Faustino. Um, uh, years and years ago, I found this excerpt in a, um, um, I forget what site it was, but it's about the um, Warai area. And um, so it's it, the account of this captain who wrote in his journal about having to track down Faustino Blint. And in that account, he states that he was somehow missing after the day that he was condemned to death. So that's, so. Um, I uh, sort of minored in Asian studies and it was an opportunity for me like, Hey, I got this rich history. Let me take this time in regards to my studies to kind of see what, what's out there. And I just kind of was throwing names into searches and stuff, seeing what popped up. We actually found out that we were spelling a blend's name wrong for many, many years. We used to spell it with an I and actually spelled with a E. And once I started spelling it correctly, all this information started coming up and it actually started to connect. Um, and so once the spelling was correct and timelines were kind of connected and I was, I was kind of reaching out to the other instructors like what do you guys think about this this account same area how how different can Faustino Oblin be at this time a moment in history um, Dan Medina, uh, Colton Kramer um, so I was reaching out to them you know you guys wrote you know a lot of stuff you guys have been part of it you know and then that's when it started we started really kind of looking to all right there's a lot of stuff that's actually out there and this was back in like the early 2000s um, when I was still in college so um, so a lot of stuff started coming out and I was like damn this is this is pretty cool you know that you know what we've been told at a young age oh this is grandpa's stories this is grandpa's life and I was like oh crap there's some actual historical because I have actually have that have some um, court documents that you know, has his name, this is when he was arrested, this is the docket and all this kind of stuff. So there's that factual stuff that's in there. But no, I hold on to the oral history that, that was told to me. And you know, it's, it's been an awesome journey to kind of see where we came from and the, the lives that it influenced. Um, and kind of keeping me connected, right? I never thought in a young age, I was like, I dreaded training, right? Because um, majority of my, we train very young, like I said, um, we actually lived next door to Great Grandmaster um, Rolo, um when I was very young in Hawaii. Um, so it's called Waiava in Hawaii, small little town. Uh, you can actually walk right past it, and not know you know it was there, uh, right next to Leeward College on, on the uh, li uh, Leeward side of, um, I mean Leeward College, right on the um, the west side of Hawaii. You know you got Pearl City, you got all these. You know, Waipahu, yeah, on Oahu. You know, uh, after, you know, a lot of Filipinos in that area, and you know, we kind of uh, congregated in this little, little, I guess you would call it a town in Waiava, um, and that's my my first sort of, um, I would say, home, right? Uh, my gr my grandparents, um, Raulio Toma Pidoy and Bartolomeo Pidoy, they lived in a little Quonset hut, right? And so 
Kwanzaa, we were connected right next to them there. So they babysitted us, we, we just grew up. Below our concert hut was his uh, fighting chickens, his pride and joy, he loved doing that his whole life. Um, and then my mom's mom, um, Julie, they lived right on the top of that little uh, cul-de-sac and they were there. So our whole lives, the best, best memories of me growing up was in that section where we would see all these Filipino guys come around. So I was, I was born in Hawaii. Um, at that time, uh, I was born in 78, so early, early 80s, maybe until about 81, 82, 83, around there. Um, but my grandparents lived there very long, so we were always going back and forth. Um, you know, Ron Anglin posts a lot of pictures where he talks about the Quonset hut and the, the deck that they yeah. built for him and stuff like that. So that's the area where they trained. Um, everyone knew. A lot of, you know, he asked, you know, we, went, we met with uh, Daniel Santos uh, a few years back and, you know, he kind of reminisced of the times that he, he would go. You know, first thing they would come to Hawaii was, let's go see, you know, Fedoy. Um, Richard Bostillo says the same thing. A lot of connections. Um, these are guys that I saw as a kid growing up, like, oh, I just see them playing in the backyard with, with, with Grandpa, you know. And it was like what we did today with the little kids. You know, they would have us just, all right, let's go. Move us around, give us action, see what we're doing, follow, play. Uh, a lot of that going up with him. Um, so our introduction was just how we lived. Everything was a lesson with him. I tell this all the time. Uh, so we live right next door. So my parents would go to work. We're like, all right, go, go next door to grandpa's house. Um, and my grandpa would play this game. So as soon as we come upon the porch, he would have his hand behind his back. So one hand would have a knife. The other hand would have like a banana or candy or fruit. And he would tell us, all right, before you come in, you gotta pick. All right, you gotta pick. You either gonna get the knife, you're gonna get pork, or you're gonna get the candy. So we'd have to pick. If that knife came, we would have to lock and try to get inside of grandma. If you get the candy, you get the candy, you get the eat, you get a hug. Right, so little stuff like that he will play around with us and, and do and that, that was our initiation into training. A lot of what we thought was just play was actually something that he was teaching us, you know, to do. Um, and, you know, for, for us as, as a grandkids, a lot of our training was on that little porch. You know, there's one picture that I have that I post up on a regular basis of him standing behind us and it's my three, my two older brothers and my stuff. So we're standing around and you know, we're actually training in that little porch that was in the front and we would do that a lot. And then, you know, we would do stuff with the chickens. He was, you know, he would throw us into the pen and see how we would react to the chicken. Is the chickens coming at us or something like that? Or he would have us, you know, do a lot of stuff. Um, in that way, so so a lot of interaction rather than you know this is what you need to do. It was just action, just play, and we say love. It's all about how we love this. So I, I really teach a, a, a blend of both. So I honor my grandfather in a certain way. I honor my uncle in a certain way. I honor my dad in a certain way. We have a Kaji Kempo background as well. We honor our grandmaster, Grandmaster Julian, Julian General Lau, in a certain way. And I built my foundation in a certain way. So when we go back to Hawaii, a lot, a lot of the guys who know, we're like, oh, that's Patikan. Oh, that's, that's Grandmaster. In the way my students move, in the way that I move. So the way I teach it is, um, uh, Batikan, we call Batikan, uh, Batikan Eri, his, his movement was, I call Big Man is Rima, right? So Big Man is Rima, um, so, and my grandfather was, was the fluidity, was, was the flow and connection and, 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 and movement. So the way I teach in regards to um, the foundation is, Batikan Eri gets us into the fight. Grandmaster finishes the fight. So I use my students' position and power to get into position, to get into range, the way Grand, uh, Batakan Eddie would. And then once we can connect and exchange, his great grandmaster's movement that allows us to finish and control and either you know, end the fight, you know, and do that. So, um, so in the movement, generally our offense is um, sort of going forward, right? Before. And generally our defense is going back. My grandfather mainly taught defense as you know, going back and using that movement. It was Bati Khan that actually said, let's work the forward triangle into position and work ourselves into position. 
<laughs> if I'm bigger and stronger, I can move position, I can cover line, and I can work that position. When I get into position, then I can move to a finish and, and move. So that's sort of that mindset. Um, and so um, the forward triangle mindset in regards to pushing forward, power forward, and using my power and position was Bhatti Khan. Grandmaster was all about receiving, right? Receiving and redirecting and using angle and, and leverage to play position. So I think I've been able to kind of marry that two together seamlessly in regards to and honoring, you know, those, those sort of mindsets, right? Bhatti Khan at his later age really wanted to put a stamp on who he was in regards to his his sort of addition or, um, um, you know, um, connection to the system. And, you know, we all knew what Grandmaster brought to the system. Um, so I think we, we I do a, a good blend of that. And, you know, a lot of our, because his background is actually Kempo, Vatican. He actually, um, he didn't want to play the stick game, right? Um, back in those days, I believe maybe it was, was maybe the, and his junk, maybe the late, early 60s around there. Um, kind of seeing, you know, Kaju Kempo, Kempo was big, judo was huge, right? Um, all these, the stick stuff and knife stuff that all the Manongs, used to play that, that's 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 whatever they play I, I don't do that this is cool right so when you say you know Bata Khan was all about hands because his background was was Kempo he was definitely taller than when when on his prime he was huge he was actually a power lifter my grandma was like this big uh maybe 411 around there five foot and my, my grandpa not that much bigger. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know perspective now, but Uncle Eddie looked, I always seemed like I looked up to him, even when I was in high school, because he actually lived with us for a few years. After a great grandmaster passed away, um, he told us, no, come up to San Diego, stay with us. Um, and that's when he actually gave us the, uh, the um, sort of the blessing, open up the school. This is when we first moved to San Diego, 91. Um, came up, I believe, in around uh, 94. It was about time when I was like a junior high, I was graduating. Um, so it was like, come live with us. And he was like, let's, we need to start moving the school forward. Um, so he reached out to us, let's get things back rolling. Let's get the family back into play. Um, and, and we did, you know, we, we kind of set a lot of things in motion in that time. That's when we had our first sort of, um, <laughs> Sort of family gathering of all instructors at that moment we're still under one head one branch um one tree i mean and uh you know we really started to get things together and it was because of box cut eddie was like you know whatever history that we had in the past and it's, a, it's a pretty deep history like what we talked about earlier but it was like we need to get everybody together you know great grandmaster's vision you know being Pretty much one of the first instructors to teach openly to non-Filipinos in 1961, you know, in Hawaii. And, um, you know, we need to be the forefront of kind of pushing the art forward. So, and, and today I take pride in that, you know, and we go back because we were called the Howley School. And for those who know, Howley just means foreigner. Um, some people may take it as a negative connotation, but you know, for the most part, we're the first ones. Oh, look at these! My gra my grandfather would say all the time, you know, why do you teach? Why do you teach these howlies? They, you know, they ask him, why do you teach these you know, non-Filipinos? Why would you want to share the secrets of you know your your heritage and your tradition? Like, I don't see them as howlies. I make them Filipino. I make them move Filipino. I make them eat like Filipino. They're Filipino to me. They love me as if they're Filipino. So he, he gave a lot to these guys and I still call them uncle. I still have a heart of endearment to them. They stuck with the system for over 70 years. You know what I'm saying? Where, you know, there's a lot of stuff here and there like other systems, but they, they, they gave everything to, to my grandfather, my grandmother, and I, I love them for what the time that they put in for that. So it, it was pretty much round the pond in the early days. The Hollies were actually put to the test. Yeah. Right, um, they we trained openly at the park, and they would at, in those early days they would regularly have challenges. Right, people coming back, or just you know local guys coming up. What are you guys doing, like, Hollywood? You want to fight? Let's go fight right now. And it was a lot of that. It was a lot having to prove that they belong. Right, and they belong. You know, they 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 put the time in. You know, Colton Kramer, Peter Schmall, um, Canuck Peacock, you know, Ron England came about at that time as well. Dan Medina is part of that in regards to the instructors that are still alive and still teaching. Um, Leslie Largo, one of the original students that came in, um, you know, 
still active. Um, Gary Largo just recently passed away, but these, these are, you know, core group that, you know, they, they stayed in the system. I mean, there's a lot of people that have come and gone, a lot of instructors that came in and kind of went their own way, but you know, those are guys that kind of kept, kept that Godoy patch on as, as many years as they could. Some of them kind of stayed away for a little bit, and then when they saw the opportunity to come back and you know, and kind of mend ways and, and, and heal hearts, you know, they came back at the time that was needed. Um, right now, there's no um, official Pedoy School of Escrima. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of history there, but you know, it's still a family system. Whatever name that I have on the wall is just a name, right? Um, the Robio is what we do. The Robio is, is my grandfather's system, my grandfather's life. Now, the Robio legacy is something is it's just something that I wanted to give to all of my compadres, right? You know, Dan Medina out on the East Coast, Ron England who recently moved up north, um, the guys back home in Hawaii that still hold the name in regards to the Robio. They may have a different brand, you know, but the Robio is still there. They still honor my grandfather. They still work and live through and teach through his name. Um, and we don't need to be under the same sort of moniker, right? But we still honor my grandfather and we still do the best that we can to keep, keep the art going. I, I've come across a lot of incidences where it could have gone bad. But what I take is um, the creed, right? So humbleness or the humility of knowing that you have a certain skill set to do something that could be bad, right? But the art, the many years that I've trained, I've trained from when I used to have a, a bottle in one hand and a stick in another hand, right? So in, in my diapers. And my dad jokes about that all the time, but um, the biggest thing wasn't the physical, right? It was a, a lot of it has been in regards to the mindset. Um, and the humility of knowing that, yeah, I could probably do something bad to you right now, but how can I control, about controlling emotions, um, de-escalating, right? So I've been able to kind of use that skill set. And even being a defensive tactics instructor, understanding, you know, how we approach and how we deal with conflict, how we deal with things, and how we deal with an attack and stimulus and, and a threat, right? Uh, a lot of it has to do with how do I communicate. How do I posture myself, right? Because someone who is confident in their actions and what they can do, they don't walk around with their chest tucked in, shoulders forward, and you know, skittish. You know, we have a you know we have a certain sort of persona or aura about us. In regards, maybe I shouldn't fool around with a, with a little Filipino guy that's standing in front of two six foot two, you know, white dudes. Why is he in the front of these guys? dealing with the situation. Maybe I shouldn't mess with that guy. Sort of thing. So a lot of it is confidence in my movement, confidence how I can react, confidence in my skill set to do a certain thing, but not needing to use it, right? My grandfather, my dad used to reiterate that time all the time is retrain so much to maybe use it once, right? Or maybe not use it at all, right? Um, the Robio, my grandfather put a lot of his religious background and beliefs into the system um, a lot of how and why we do certain things is to preserve life right it's all about preserving it so the way we talk about we talk about opening the gates so the body has 12 gates and that's our joints right so wrist elbow shoulder hip knee ankle so we open up the gates we open up the mind we tell the person if you continue I'm not just gonna break this I'm not just gonna damage this I can open you up here, kind of open this up and say, realize you know, what's happening to you right now. If not, if I need to go to your inner gates and do damage and finish and go what we call the 11th hour, I can do, but I want to do as much as I can possibly to allow you to live and give you the opportunity to be like, yeah, I want my life. I like my life. Maybe I should not do what I'm doing, right? Yeah. So um, a lot of that came from how he was taught through Faustino Blinn. Faustino, they, they um, kind of going back to when I first started talking, they saw him as a messianic leader or someone that, you know, at that time kind of as like God, God-like, right? So someone who they kind of revered as, you know, connected to God and he has that, that power to sort of save life and, and prevent death. Um, so what they would do in those days, um, kind of connected, like 
um, they would wake, make anting anting, right? So little amulets and stuff like that. So the Pulahanes would actually have these coins and, and Papa Faustino would pray on these, these coins. So a lot of tied into like um, Catholicism and a lot of different beliefs in regards to you know, power and anting anting. So they would literally, I'll pray on these coins, put the coins on their eyes, these strips of cloth they would write scripture in and they would tie it across their eyes and go into battle blindfolded being like i'm i'm guided by by god through this power that was anointed by this man and i'm gonna either i'm gonna do what i need to do but if i die i die i, I, you know, I ascend kind of thing uh, so a lot of that was tied into his training at a young age and then he kind of grew into that as he went to hawaii he got uh, affiliated with, and he was a deacon and a priest with the Moncado Church. Um, and Moncado Church um, was led by a man named Moncado, and it's sort of uh, it's a small little group now. But at that time in the early 20s, a lot of the Filipinos kind of kind of congregated to that that religion. And he was he was part of the Moncado Church until you know um, until he passed away. Um, and some of the uh, uh, the Haoles, uh, our instructors back home, they're connected to that church, a part of that church still. So, uh, a lot of Catholicism is built into that religion and the belief of life and, and resurrection and power of that. No, God only has that power to resurrect life, so where is it in us to, to take it upon us to take life, right? We, don't, we should not take that upon us. Um, so that's, that's sort of how he kind of built the way we do what we do. It's just, it's just the passion that I have. And it's something that maybe in my 20s, I didn't think I would be here in this moment. Back then it was like, crap, I gotta go work out again? Crap, my dojo is my garage. I can't hide <laughs> from that, right? And it, it felt like it was so forced and it was supposed to be my older brother. My older brother was supposed to be in this position and I get kind of caught up when I talk about it, but he actually took a, a greater calling, right? He's actually a pastor and he's leading men in a certain way in life, right? So he's a pastor, he's a missionary out in Okinawa and he took that mantle. I was like, dude, you're supposed to do this. Like, you're supposed to take over. I'm supposed to do my own thing. Um, but, you know, once I came back and was like, maybe this is something that needs to be done. Um, and right now, I'm the only family member that's actively teaching, right? Um, and that's something that I put a big, big burden on my shoulders because it should be someone from our family that continues to be here. Because it was always put, this is the family tree. My brother was supposed to take over, it was my uncle, it was my, my cousin, and I wasn't on that tree. I wasn't supposed, and, was, and when I look at it, I was like, you know, things happen for a reason. Maybe, um, maybe early 2000s, it was like, when my dad was like, I need somebody, like I need somebody, you know, I'm ready to kind of pass it on. He was like, it's yours, this is, this is you, you know? And I was like, all right, let's see what happens. And then slowly but surely, I was like, this is, this is me. This is a part of me now. And um, I tell my wife all the time, if I have one student, and it, it, was, it was moments in time where that one student was the only one showing up, right? And you've probably been there as well. That one student says, hey, no, I'm still here. You still got a student. Well, we got one more coming back and it was the ebb and flow right now i'm blessed to have you know the kids that you've seen the families have been a part i'm blessed to be like no i have students you know that are now getting married and having their own kids throw my grandpa's name out all the time but like i'm this of this right and i'm like my face isn't on the forefront of anything right now it's like this this is why this this is it that, that kid right there, my son, that, that's the reason why, right? Um, my daughter, they have little snippets of her in there, that's the reason why, right? They need to know why we do, why I do what I do. Because, you know, it does a strong strain in regards to my jobs, strong strain in regards to my marriage. I've been married with my wife for almost, you know, married for 16 going on 17, together for almost 21 years. There's a lot of strain there because she didn't understand as well. It's like, what is that? That's just playing around. Why, how is, why is that a focus? Why did you create your work life around this? That, you're not getting any money there. That's, that's, that's not a career. And that was her view for many, many years. 
And now she's the one dragging these kids here. You guys gotta make sure you guys go to class. You gotta be part. And she actually became a student, you know? And I wanna get her back in, but you know, having kids and all that. <laughs> but you know, she knows now. We, we have had pretty deep conversations of, I am nothing without this. If this is, this is part of my persona, this is part of my psyche, this is part of my being. If I don't have this, I don't know how depressed I can be. In 2008, I was forced to make a decision, right? Um, I had recently taken over, taken over my, my school uh, from my dad in 2000, eight years ago, I'm pretty strong. Um, and then a family member comes in and is like, you gotta cease and desist. You can't use my name, you can't use grandpa's name, you can't use grandpa's photos, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. I kind of understand where he was coming from. Uh, it, was, it hurts, but you know, it, it, it's, it was family, right? Family. And you know, we've talked about it. Um, I, I've mended ways. We actually, there was a part where I wasn't talking to him for about five, six, seven years. Um, so Grandmaster Tyrone Takahashi. So I love him. We've, we've come, um, if this goes out, I love my uncle. This is what happened. This is truth. And we all moved out from this, right? Um, the instructors in Hawaii, you know, Ron England, Dan Medina, myself. Um, we, it happened. Right, history happens. Um, it hurt because it came from my uncle, my godfather, there you go. my mom's youngest brother. Right, so now we we've talked about it. We cleared paths. We have we don't talk about Eskrima together anymore. So this this history has passed. We have mended ways. But you know, there's a good time between 2008 2009 when I had needed to make a decision and move away. So when that was forced upon me, and then other schools went a certain way as well. You know, he made decisions that he, he most likely regrets, right? Yeah, it, it caused the breakdown of the family in regards to the Bedoy School of Screen, right? Instructors had to go their own way. Um, but it, it actually grew the school, right? They, they, they was like, all right, if I can't have this, let's see what I can do with what I got. Let's see what I can create. Ron created one, right? Hola, Nalo. Nalo. Um, Hawaii created a, a Hawaii Derobio and General Blend School came out of that. Um, Dan Medina has his Majapai uh, Derobio um, and um, you know we have um, um, Brandon Jordan with his group out of, of Dan Medina and I have my school. Right? So that connection has been, like I said, whatever moniker we have, but that breakdown happened in 2008-2009 and it was, it was a, a big huge dagger in my heart. And it was like, I'm done. Like, if, if family takes this away from me and they tear away my identity, which was my grandfather, my uncle, the family, the system, then I'm done. And then I started reaching out to Dan Medina. I reached out to Ron England because they went the same, they kind of went through the same thing. I reached out to Carlton Kramer and I told him, this is what I'm going to do. I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna, you know, whatever name that I create, I'm gonna continue and, and move forward and, and build and do that. And I created what I created. You know, I, I went to Hawaii, I don't know how many times, because my uncle, I love him to death, but he, he wasn't part of this. Like I told you, there was, there was a break between family and the students that were there. Attention was given somewhere else, and family thought like they were kind of backs turned to them. So they're like, all right, grandpa, we love you. Go do, go do that, we'll move on. Um, and then, you know, he came back. He saw what we were doing in San Diego. We took a group to Maui in 2004. We hosted a stick fighting tournament with uh, Ted T Shion Ted Tabora and Sifu Willie K, uh, Festival of Kings. We hosted their stick fighting system. My uncle came over with Carlton Kramer and the other guys like, oh, this is cool. I'm back, right? I'm the grandmaster. So, we wanted you to come back forever. Here's everything that we have. Um, create what you need to do. Here's all the information that we have that you can have, and to help them build. And for about four years, it was that building up. This is where you should be. This is where we are. Let's build everything up. And for him to come back and be like, "I'm here. You need to be there, right? Whatever you did, that's fine, but it should be me." That's what it felt like. I don't know if he saw something differently. I don't know if he saw me trying to 
take something away from him, whatever it was. Bygones be bygones, I love you. I put family in front of the system at that point. Um, and we were able to mend ways a couple years back, but yeah, it was like them taking my heart. Family, my God, someone that was my godfather in, in real life, my uncle be like, nah. It wasn't even a conversation, bro. It was, here's a letter in the mail. A letter in the mail, cease and desist. So, you know, that's out there, but it happened. Um, I can honestly say I love my uncle to death. We're, we're back in good terms. Uh, but that's what happens. A lot of systems go through that. You know that. A lot of systems go through that conflict and it either will break it or it created what it did with one General Blin School, Dan Medina School, Rajapai, uh, Mandala Mandarigma with Brandon Jordan, Hawaii Dorobo Academy, and you know. So we're still here, right? And you know, I've been able to use the um, sort of the foundation of the Oreo and create my system, right? Um, things that I go back to Hawaii and my mentors, my uncles, they're like flabbergasted. It's like, I see the Oreo, but it's such something so much more. When my dad comes down and and he sees what I what I been able to do. With my kids, and then, and then you're the I, I've, he's always said I've, I've taught him as much as I can, and he's just taking it to the next level. And for him to say, "No, I'm proud of you. I love you. You did what I couldn't do," <clears throat> means a lot. <laughs> all these years that I failed, all these years that I I, I put aside other things. To kind of hold whatever thread that I had in regards to this system mattered, right? So I don't call it a burden anymore. I just call it that's me. That's who I am. And um, still to today, you know, I, I mold my 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 family life and work life around this, right? And I finally been able to come to a balance. And I've created so many. I've I don't say created. I built my family outward, right? So. These kids have been training together since they were seven, six, right? Um, five. <laughs> Selena's getting married, man. She's like, she called me uh, yesterday. She's like, hey, can you walk my mom down the aisle in the processional? I was like, most definitely, right? And uh, so, you know, this is family that you choose. I talk about it all that time. You know, family that you choose and that choose you. And that's sometimes those bonds are stronger than blood. So yeah, so he's getting a little bit bigger. So he, this is my, this is my Padawan, right? This is my protege, I13, and I like it a lot because he knows that he can go hard on me, and that makes helps me learn. And what? I know it's not like being me um, because. He's my dad and I have family here, like you were saying earlier. And friends, family, and it's fun to me to learn to learn the history too. It's actually a really fun. The history is amazing. So that, that's like, your history, that's your family, right? That's your grandpa on that wall. Your, that's your uh, no, grandpa on the wall that's over there. So I plant as much seeds as I can go and, and grow. Uh, definitely kind of teaching like he talks about going hard on him now right um, I definitely was was taught a certain way being one of my dad's you know, number one who is growing up right um, he never let up he probably did more right because I was his son uh, my father and you know I kind of relay that back right and I tell him it's, it's about love right you need to learn you need to feel and I do that with I I see all my students as my kids so you see them like running up and giving me a hug um, and you know, it's it's that 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 communication through touch. Um, this is all about love, right? Doing those things and understanding that you know what we do here is about life, love, safety, passing on history and knowledge, tradition, and you know just the connection from here to there, right? Um, so yeah. So Ron and his his boys. You know, they're they're connected they're together all the time and I, I throw in stuff here and there when we're out right you know 
uh, what they can see, how they can perceive things, how they work things out. Um, you know, a band of brothers, right? A band of brothers kind of thing. Uh, but definitely, it's, 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 no, you guys will always be one, one part of us, will always be our life. I tell guys all the time, I have guys who had trained with me off and on for 20 years. Now they go, they're in military deployment, and the first thing they do when they come back to San Diego, off the plane, literally, Chief, I'm back, when's class, right? Or I got guys who literally drive from Arizona every weekend to come and train because, Chief, I want to be with you. I can do other things, but I want to be with you. Um, and those are the connections that really mean a lot to me. Or guys that are all the way in Florida that call me on a daily basis. It's like, hey Chief, first thing I do when I land, how many days can you give me to train, right? Um, I'm coming just to see you kind of thing. Or just that as soon as they know who they can call. and be like, hey Chief, I'm going through something right now. Can we talk? Yeah. Um, and and that's, that's, the, that's the payment we get. We're not gonna get rich on this, bro. You know, um, you know, and but the richness is in the relationships, right? And you know, I, I tell my wife all the time, you know, and she understands that now that it, it's, it's 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 my passion. I tell guys all the time, dude, why are you gonna rush and do that? You got your day job, you gonna you're doing all this just to make it back to train for two hours to teach people for two hours? So yeah, because that's my life, that's my passion, that's what keeps me sane, bro. That's what keeps me sane. And it was like she knew from day one when we started dating. It was this. She was like, what do you, what do you do? Uh, she knew me in high school. I would do demos in high school, so she knew what I was. I mean, she worked through two. You know, we had two storefronts. She, she kind of dealt with that and dealt, you know, seeing that. But we, we have a good home here and where we're at, and we have a good core, what I call my core. And you know, from time to time, we have people come and go, but. Five, 
We're clearing to go so high guard, so I slip under the arm. And I'm coming across here and I'm cinching up vice grip. I want to go back and slide, squeeze, close it up, set it here. Back and work again, chops into this position here. Okay? And six. This is Grandmaster likes to do this. He goes to high guard ball. I slip across, I don't cinch, or I'm going to finish to a choke. I'm closing this out here. I can do a takedown, whatever. I want to get him off of his feet, get him to a seated position. And, right, these are entries to some sort of finish that can happen after that. Alrighty? Wait! I grew up there. I, 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 you know, my parents came over here when I was four, uh, and then grew up here in San Diego. And um, like growing up, I had like a just a kung fu background. Uh, and I, when I had kids, I, you know, thought, you know, let's teach them a little bit about you know Philippines and their heritage and you know the kind of stuff that we did there, and uh, or my ancestors. And you know, I found Chaz. Uh, I brought him into the class. I have four boys actually that are all in the class. And he's in an adult class now with us. Uh, and I brought him into the class and he started it all for our family. So, I mean, uh, I don't even have my white coat yet, so I'm pretty brand new. But this class is pretty like going with the flow. Like, whatever drill works best with the entire skill level of the class. Um, whatever Chief figures out like is best, like that's what we like. Even though it's advanced for me, it's, it's nothing new for the other guys. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. Well, I like being here to learn how to defend myself. I, I've been coming for five years, and I keep coming back to this class. So you learn a lot. Um, it's very technical, but once you get your feet, um, like moving, it just feels good to get it. It's family now. It's family now. You know, Chaz, the Shanko family, um, all our kids, 